Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Gunnar Paulson. I'm the Director General of the Icelandic Competition Authority. And on my left is Valur Thrawenson. He's uh, the Chief Economist of the ICA. Uh, I want to sincerely uh, welcome you to, to this uh, webinar where we plan to uh, discuss competition policy issues under the heading Protectionism and Antitrust Enforcement a transatlantic view. I think it's, uh, it, it can be said for all countries and regions in the world that um, competition policy issues are quite urgent given the economic and even social climate today. This is also the case in Iceland where we are addressing the econ economic downturn uh, caused by COVID-19. But even if we set aside the, the COVID-19 issues, we, like all countries, have been and will be experiencing uh, changes in how markets are functioning because of uh, digitalization, environmental changes, etc. And in this context, I think it's very interesting to reflect on the competition policy debates taking place on both sides of the Atlantic. This particular webinar derives from the fact that the Icelandic Competition Authority had taken on the task to host meetings in late May uh, as a part of the International Cooperation of Competition Authorities, uh, more specifically within the European Competition Network and the Cooperation of Nordic Competition Authorities. Obviously, these meetings were cancelled, but instead we thought that it would be interesting to organize a webinar that could not only be useful with respect to cooperation of competition authorities, but also for all those uh, that are in some way or another dealing with competition policy issues or otherwise are interested. And I'm pleased to say that almost 250 people have registered for the webinar from over 40 countries uh, around the world. We have a very impressive panel of, of participants today all of them with a diverse academic experience um, and also with a range of experience in dealing with competition enforcement and other tasks related to competition policy. In the west of the Atlantic, we have two renowned academics, Jonathan B. Baker, a research professor uh, of law at the American University Washington College of Law. Uh, he has recently published a book, The Antitrust Paradigm, and is a co-author of an antitrust casebook. He has previously served as a chief economist of the Federal Communications Commission and as a director of the Bureau of Economics at the FTC. And uh, Fiona Scott Morton, who is a professor of economics at the Yale University of Management. Her area of academic research is empirical. Uh, industrial organizations with a focus on, on empirical studies of competition. From 2011 to 2012, she served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for, for Economics at the Antitrust, Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. On the east side of the Atlantic, we have also two very respected participants. Pierre Rezipo, uh, the Chief Competition Economist of the Directorates General for Competition in the European Commission. He has an academic background at leading institutions like uh, MIT, Northwestern University and the University of Essex, where he currently is honorary visiting professor. He has also been active in economic consulting in parallel to his academic career. And my colleague, Lars Sörgat, Director General of the Norwegian Competition Authority uh, and prior to that, uh, Chief Economist at the Authority. Uh, he has also an academic background as a professor at the Norwegian School of Economics in Bergen for the last two decades, I believe. And finally, in the middle of the Atlantic, that's to say in Iceland, we have Gilve Magnusson, Associate Professor of the Department of Business Administration at the University of Iceland. He served as a Minister of Business and uh, as a Minister of Business and Economic Affairs in the Icelandic government from 2009 to 2010, and has also been previously a, a chairman of the board of the Icelandic 
competition authority. Well, we have organized this webinar in such a way that uh, we will have a 20 minute, minute keynote address from Jonathan Baker, then followed by a panel discussion with all the participants, moderated by Waller and me. The panel will reflect in general on how competition authorities uh, should react in the current economic climate. With that in mind, we address the current debates taking place both in Europe and in, in the United States. Uh, we will also address the current debates taking place in Europe uh, on, the, on if competition enforcement should, be, should allow for uh, European champions. And we will discuss to what extent it is likely that the current economic crisis will be met with protectionism and a more relaxed competition enforcement. We also want to give you uh, who are viewing a chance to ask uh, questions to the participants. You can use the question section on the right side of the screen for that purpose. And we also plan to give you the possibility to answer a few questions as we are uh, as we go along. Those questions will be displayed in the poll section on the right side on the on the screen. So, without further ado, uh, I invite Jonathan on the states with the keynote uh, address. Uh, Jonathan, are you ready? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Malur and uh, Pade Gunnar for inviting me, and, and hello to everyone around the world I, I see from the, the chat list. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, what I'm going to do this today is uh, describe how the... Well, uh, I'm going to talk about national champions and national competitiveness and antitrust from the United States in the 1980s uh, to Europe today, but mostly about the U.S. in the 1980s. Uh, I'm going to I plan to describe how the uh, U.S. enforcement agencies navigated a debate about antitrust policy and national competitiveness uh, 35 years ago and sketch what the economics literature has to say and then suggest some lessons that may be relevant for the current European debate about national champions and uh, competition policy. Uh, so in so. Just in gross oversimplification, uh, from in the decades following uh, World War II, devastated uh, economies in Europe and Japan were rebuilt, and developing and some developing nations uh, uh, began to grow grow rapidly. So over time, uh, U.S. firms faced more and more global competition in some important domestic U.S. markets, notably from Japanese firms. This led to a U.S. debate about national competitiveness in which antitrust played a part. I'm going to give uh, examples involving steel and automobiles uh, because these are high profile industries where growing competition drew a political response and uh, they raised antitrust enforcement and policy issues, uh, uh, prominent ones, in the early 1980s. So let me start with uh, automobiles. Um, uh, sort of at the beginning of the, at the end of the 1960s, uh, uh, there was a, a oligopoly in the U.S. with the three three large firms: General Motors, the largest, Ford, and Chrysler. That and collectively, those three firms sold about 87 percent of new cars at the end of the 1960s. Uh, by the 1980s, that share uh, during that decade was in the 70 to 75 percent range. So they lost substantial uh, market share. And the main reason was a, uh, an explosive growth in innovation and uh, productivity during the 1970s by Nissan and Toyota. Uh, those, those two firms made uh, cars in Japan and shipped them to the United States. Honda became important, but that wasn't really till the 1980s. Um, uh, in 1970, Consumer Reports, uh, a consumer publication, a well-known consumer publication, rated the Toyota Corolla not acceptable. It was not, uh, the quality was not good. But by eight years later, uh, Nissan and Toyota had the highest quality and lower pr lowest uh, priced subcompacts, and their cars were much better than uh, uh, comparably priced domestic cars in the United States. 
And uh, by 1980, the th highest selling subcompacts you know, uh, were in the United States were imports from Nissan, Toyota, and Honda. Uh, it's a similar story about uh, uh, import competition in steel. Um, after World War II, uh, the, United, the U.S. firms accounted more, for more than half of world steel production, but it was only 14% of world production in 1980. Uh, first, European steel firms uh, grew. Uh, that was, uh, uh, they grew rapidly during the 1950s, and Japanese steel makers grew rapidly during the 1960s and 1970s. From 1974 to 1984, domestic U.S. steel production fell by 63%. While steel consumption in the industrialized world declined by only 21 percent, and now one reason the U.S. industry experienced hard times was that the world economy uh, experienced multiple recessions. But another reason was import competition. Um, imports accounted for about 12 to 18 percent of domestic U.S. consumption throughout the 1970s, and that was with imports limited by voluntary restraint agreements between the United States and Europe. Japan, and various developing countries. So why did the US firms flounder and Japanese firms succeed in the early 1980s? That was the subject of a, of a lot of discussion uh, in the United States uh, um, by the early 1980s. And some of the possible explanations that were debated about the, at the time pointed to uh, distinctive features of Japan and its firms. Was it Japanese industrial uh, policy, you know, MITI, a government agency? Was it long-term uh, managerial orientation of Japanese firms? Was it a Japanese tolerance for domestic cartels that could focus on export competition? But the early 1980s uh, policy debate also looked to economy-wide factors to explain U.S. trade deficits, slow productivity growth, and lost national competitiveness. Uh, you know, so was it adverse exchange rates, high wages and production costs in the U.S.? Did U.S. tax policies discourage investment? Did uh, Japanese domestic trade protection limit U.S. firms' access to Japanese markets? Now, I'm an industrial organization economist, and uh, I gravitate toward uh, industry-specific explanations for the success of new firms. And I can, I'll give you some for automobiles and steel. In autos, the big three uh, U.S. automakers didn't want to cannibalize their uh, highly profitable larger models. Uh, uh, by introducing subcompacts, and they probably thought there was a reasonable chance that the oil price shocks wouldn't last, reversing the demand shift to large cars. So that so they uh, accommodated the uh, Japanese entry during the 1970s, and uh, in, in at some in, of some subcompact uh, models. In steel, after the Second World War, large U.S. Uh, the the large U.S. steel makers uh, rationally delayed switching to uh, a new technology, basic oxygen furnaces. Uh, for a decade until their European and Japanese rivals, which uh, were starting afresh after the war and had no sunk costs, uh, no investments in the older open hearth technology, showed that the new product, new uh, production process was low cost and high quality. But regardless of the uh, particular explanation, um, uh, there was a, a, a policy debate about national competitiveness around in, in the early 1980s. And, uh, and, and it led to an antitrust policy debate. Uh, there's a broader economic and intellectual context uh, that's important to, to emphasize too. The policy debate in the US took place in a, in a very difficult economic environment. Between the early 1970s and the early 1980s, the US economy experienced uh, two oil price shocks, three recessions, a productivity slowdown, uh, sluggish income growth for workers, and increased foreign competition. And some commentators blamed antitrust for impeding the ability of US firms to achieve efficiencies and innovate. And it wasn't just the Chicago School, but it was the Chicago School, but it wasn't only them. There was a, a pro-industrial policy left that uh, uh, blamed antitrust as well. So uh, Lester Thoreau, a, a very well-known uh, MIT economist, thought that the antitrust laws made no sense in markets with international trade. And then Ira Magaziner and Robert Reich, who were well-known public intellectuals, and Robert Reich is still uh, uh, active uh, uh, today, uh, uh, wrote in a book, I'm gonna read a quote, some firms show so much promise 
of becoming strong international competitors that the government should allow and encourage them to engage in horizontal or vertical mergers and to expand capacity readily, notwithstanding that these strategies may lessen competition in domestic markets in the short run. So in antitrust, these uh, economic and intellectual currents uh, came to a head in uh, 1984. In Steele that year, the Justice Department reviewed simultaneously two proposed mergers involving large domestic steel manufacturers, and the Federal Trade Commission in automobiles uh, reviewed a proposed uh, joint venture between General Motors and Toyota to produce small cars in California. So let me talk first about the steel mergers and how the uh, something like the national champions uh, argument uh, um, uh, arose there. The Justice Department was reviewing two uh, mergers simultaneously. The LTD Republic merger was between the third and fourth largest U.S. firms. And then the U.S. Steel proposed to acquire National. That was the first and fifth largest firms. And the four merging firms collectively uh, had a market share of greater than 50%. And the merging parties argued that their uh, mergers would enhance their ability to compete with foreign firms by generating substantial com uh, efficiencies. The Justice Department did not uh, uh, buy that argument and challenge both mergers. Um, they said industry uh, concentration was high and increasing. Foreign competition was limited by the voluntary restraint agreements in steel. Efficiencies uh, were smaller than what the uh, parties claimed and the firms were not failing. So, so DOJ announced its intention to sue. And after that, uh, US Steel and National immediately abandoned their merger, but LTV and Republic continued to negotiate with the government. And this led to a highly unusual and high level public debate within the Reagan administration. Uh, the Secretary of Commerce publicly uh, called the Justice Department's decision to challenge the two mergers a world-class mistake, and the US Trade Representative agreed. And their argument was similar to the argument for national champions. Uh, they said that import competition from foreign firms would prevent harm, while at the same time, cost savings would help the firms compete better domestically and in export markets. And they said that these uh, 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 cases showed how the international competitiveness of U.S. firms was hindered by our antitrust laws. A month after challenging the two uh, mergers, the Justice Department reached a consent settlement approving the LTV uh, Republic merger with uh, a couple plant divestitures. Um, the Justice Department credited some efficiencies, uh, even though uh, the merger guidelines that were then current, the 1982 merger guidelines, seemed to offer little opportunity to do that. Less than three months later, after, uh, after approving, after you know, clearing that merger with divestitures, settling the merger, the Justice Department revised its merger guidelines, these were the 1984 guidelines now, uh, to address issues that were raised by the national competitiveness debate. On efficiencies, uh, uh, they moved it, it had been a defense, uh, uh, framed as a defense in the 1982 guidelines and it became part of the analysis of competitive effects. But the guidelines still required that the merging firms prove their efficiency claims with clear and compelling evidence, which is a very high uh, uh, burden. Uh, the efficiency section did not go through its major reworking then. That didn't happen until On foreign competition, the, uh, 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 the guidelines clarified that foreign firms would be assigned shares based on their extent, the extent of their ability to sell in the United States which could be limited by trade restraints like quotas. Now, some people interpreted these revisions as a capitulation to the critics um, uh, in the administration, um, uh, who, the ones who criticized the LTV Republic uh, challenge, but the revisions were actually just cosmetic. The Justice Department said it would resolve both the uh, initial challenge and the approval after the vesture the same way uh, under both guidelines. And the Assistant Attorney General said, I do not regard the 1984 revisions as having changed anything. Now, let me turn to automobiles and tell you what happened there. Uh, the, the, there was a production joint venture between uh, uh, proposed between General Motors, which was the largest firm in the U.S. auto industry, uh, 
and Toyota, the fourth largest, um, to build small cars in a California plant. General Motors had at times been close to a dominant firm, but it was the largest at any rate. Uh, the automobiles would be mar marketed separately under different brand names. And this was a tight industry oligopoly with General Motors as the price leader. Entry was difficult. In import competition was limited by, the, by trade agreements. Uh, the competition concerns were that the joint venture would reduce direct competition between GM and Toyota, which were number one and number four, uh, and that uh, coordination would be facilitated uh, industry-wide through information exchange. The justification uh, was that it would help General Motors learn how to make inexpensive, high-quality uh, small cars, which it uh, claimed to be unable to do, and that Toyota could use the joint venture to learn how to build and run a U.S. assembly plant, facilitate, facilitating eventual uh, facilities-based competition. So the Federal Trade Commission uh, allowed the joint venture to proceed uh, by a three to two vote, but subjected it to um, restrictions on its size and on the information the firms could share. And that outcome does not seem particularly remarkable today, but the case was hugely controversial at the time. It marked the moment when the Federal Trade Commission rejected structural antitrust, structural era antitrust in favor of the Chicago School approach. And the majority undertook a wide ranging uh, analysis of competitive effects beyond market structure and considered efficiencies, even though the prior case law emphasized presumptions of harm from concentrated market structures. The argument for the uh, joint venture was not about uh, relaxing the antitrust laws to create a national champion, not quite the same as steel, uh, partly because uh, uh, GM had partnered with a Japanese firm and partly because the Federal Trade Commission uh, is an independent agency insulated from direct political pressure. But the argument was indirectly about national competitiveness. Uh, the leading domestic firm was saying it needed the merger-related efficiencies to compete better with global rivals. So, so let me uh, 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 step back and look at how the agencies, the two government enforcement agencies navigated the uh, national competitiveness debate in the U.S. in 1984. Uh, they successfully resisted political pressure to relax the antitrust laws in the name of uh, national competitiveness. Uh, and, and their strategies were first to reframe the um, uh, political debate as about technical issues in the antitrust law, the treatment of efficiencies and foreign competition in merger analysis. And then they used the merger guideline revisions and the consent settlements to clarify that mergers and joint ventures could confer efficiencies that enhance the ability of firms to compete domestically and internationally, uh, and to show that mergers thought to enhance national competitiveness could be permitted so long as competition concerns were addressed. But they didn't compromise their core values. Uh, the agencies never accepted the argument that greater international comp competitiveness could justify less than domestic competition. And later economic evidence confirmed that their view was correct. And so let me just quickly go through the uh, evidence from the economic literature showing that domestic competition uh, fosters international competitiveness. There were two major <coughs> cross-national and cross-industry studies by economists interested in business strategy that were prompted by the 1980s competitiveness debate in the United States. And they both showed the productivity benefits of domestic competition. So uh, uh, Michael Porter's 1990 book, uh, uh, in his book, he, uh, uh, he found that vigorous domestic rivalry in an industry helps make that industry gains and sustain competitive advantage internationally. And then there, was a, uh, there were a series of studies by the McKinsey uh, Global Institute, uh, summarized in a popular book by William Lewis uh, a little later, uh, that found that national competition boosts national productivity. And it also found that product market competition in a nation has a first order importance, you know, as great as macroeconomic policy in explaining cross-national variation in economic performance. And these conclusions are uh, consistent with more recent empirical uh, economic studies. And I'm thinking particularly of, uh, of a, a survey article by Nicholas Bloom and John Van Rienen, and another survey article by Thomas Holmes and James Schmidt, both published in 2010, and these, the studies surveyed consistently find that uh, enhanced competition leads to greater productivity in, in an industry and that the exercise of market power reduces it. So let me conclude by just, just by noting uh, two problems with a policy of 
creating national champions that go beyond the problem I've emphasized, the harm to domestic productivity. And these other problems were uh, recognized in the US uh, uh, debate over national competitiveness in the 1980s also. One is the who is us problem. And that's uh, the title of an article by Robert Reich uh, in Harvard Business Review. Uh, so uh, a firm's top management and its ownership might be in one jurisdiction, while most of its employees and facilities might be in another. So is an appropriate European champion a firm that's owned, led, and headquartered in Europe? Or is it one with most of its employees, R&D, product design, and complex manufacturing in Europe? If they, because those could differ. And can a firm be a European champion if its leadership, ownership, employees, and facilities are spread around the world with only some of them in Europe? And the other problem is that national champions may ultimately lead to less competition. Uh, if geographic markets are global, uh, not European, let's say, and all major jurisdictions create national champions, well, will global markets become concentrated and perform less competitively? And if so, is Europe made better off by creating a national champion? So let me stop there. Uh, I have a, 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 a little handout that Valorian might uh, be able to send around later that has the has some references to articles about uh, uh, that would get you into the, the, the competitiveness debate in the 1980s, the steel and the auto industry at the time, and the, the articles about competition and productivity uh, uh, within the markets and across nations. And thank you very much. To speak on behalf of at least all of the parties that are under 50 years old, that they enjoyed uh, this historical perspective, uh, which is relevant today. Uh, this is a discussion that we hear here in Iceland in small uh, nations that uh, local firms need to be able to uh, strengthen. Uh, 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 locally in order to uh, operate internationally. Uh, this is a topic that has been in the discussion in Europe for the last few years, uh, especially following the Siemens and Alstom merger. Uh, so I am uh, look forward to hear more from the other panelists on what they will have to say about this topic. Uh, but before I will give the floor to the other panelists, I just wanted to raise some housekeeping rules which have been mentioned here. Uh, feel free, all these 140 participants all over the world, to ask questions. Uh, you can use the chat to chat. Everything that you write there is visible. Uh, if you want the panel to address questions that has been raised, upvote them. Uh, we will not be able to answer all questions, but we will see later on which of those questions will be upvoted. Uh, and lastly, for the next uh, uh, next hour, we will post four questions that are related to the topics here. So there will be a poll, and we are looking forward to see uh, the views of the participants of the questions that we will uh, publish uh, in the next hour. Uh, but uh, uh, going for further, uh, uh, antitrust development in Europe and the U.S. Uh, Fiona, we are uh, would very much like to hear uh, your perspective uh, how it has developed for the last few years. Could you comment on that? Yes, I would be happy to, and thanks everybody for the invitation. It's a delight to be here. I'm sorry I can't be in, uh, but this is the next best thing. So uh, the view from the United States, I think, is not very uh, is not very uh, cheerful. We had the Chicago School uh, Revolution in the way of thinking about antitrust, as you all know, in the 70s, and that had a great deal of influence in moving courts in a direction of uh, thinking that less enforcement was better for consumers. And that uh, did some damage initially, of course, but um, not so much because there was quite vigorous antitrust enforcement in the United States up until the 70s. But lately, these opinions have accumulated. And so now we have courts working with several decades of jurisprudence, 
that generally make assumptions about um, what firms can and cannot do and what courts can and cannot do that are not justified by the economics and um, and much too broad. So, for example, uh, monopolies will be overthrown, uh, markets self-correct by themselves. Courts are unable to tell apart anti-competitive conduct from pro-competitive conduct. Uh, predatory pricing is not rational and we'll never see it. Uh, collusion, tacit collusion among an oligopoly is too difficult and won't happen. These kinds of assumptions are baked into, <coughs> excuse me, uh, court decisions that we have uh, accumulated over the last decades. The result of this is that we now have in the last few years opinions like the American Express opinion that um, uh, made some unfortunate choices about market definition and also uh, really increase the burden on plaintiffs. Um, we have merger decisions like Sprint T-Mobile and Sabre Fair Logics, where courts are confronted with overwhelming evidence that the parties compete and find that they get that does not pass uh, the evidentiary bar they have in mind. So I think we've arrived at a place where courts are expecting economists and the plaintiff to prove with some kind of certainty about bad things happening. And we really don't know how to do that. It's not possible to predict that well. And so we are not enforcing very well in the United States and markets are becoming less and less competitive in a variety of different areas. Um, so that's bad. Yeah. That's what we heard from, I think you, Jonathan Baker, that you're quite skeptical of the antitrust enforcement in the US. Uh, but if you look at the other side of the Atlantic, Pierre. Uh, let's see. Yes. Well, if you if you really want to get depressed, Fiona, you can have a look at the 1,000 page decision that the general court just landed in the UK mobile phone case. Uh, it, ha it has it all, believe me. But I'm not going to dwell on this, and I'm going to come back a little bit more to the issue of, uh, of you know, industrial policy and then, and what what barriers it might put to the enforcement. So, as you know, we've been subjected to a lot of pressure from member states saying that we are just too draconian, especially in terms of uh, merger control, that we're also too draconian in terms of state aid, and that stands in the way of uh, creating and supporting those champions that would ensure the felicity and success of the European Union. Now, I, I happen to also be a trade economist, so I wear the scars of this kind of debate fairly deep. And going back to educating the younger crowd, uh, even in modern time, this kind of debate goes back a long way. It started with the so-called import substitution uh, kind of uh, strategies that were promoted mostly in South America by this kind of near revolutionary kind of economist. And this, the idea was a little bit like what you mentioned for Iceland. Uh, we could be competitive, but we haven't had time. So we need to protect our, our home market so it can be and efficient enough, and then we can venture in the world. Then that muted into something which is maybe more relevant for Iceland, saying, well, even if we do that, our home market is very small, so it's not going to help very much. So what we should do is still protect our home market, but then subsidize our venture into the big bad world until the point where we can stand on our own two feet, so the export promotion of the Chinese tiger. Then you had the Japanese model, which was a mix of the two, plus uh, the addition of the Keisha element, i.e. the vertical integration of the group's element. After that came the strategy trade policy, which also relates to an aspect of the debate, which is prominent right now, and has already been mentioned by Jonathan, which is you should not concentrate, concentrate just on the effect in your home market, but there are desirable effects if that happens outside of your home market. And the naive and inaccurate way that this was presented is that if you become more efficient at home, then you can kind of shift profit in the world market from down foreigners to yourself. And that's good because your shareholders are good Americans and all good, uh, good Europeans, and that should be part of your welfare function. After that, things became a bit more sophisticated. We had economic geography, 
And economic geography looked at something different, which was externalities, which is something which is a bit dearer to the heart of economists, and made the case for possible, you know, concentration to take into account of a bunch of horizontal and vertical uh, externalities. And then in the end, the most recent thing is the empirical work of people like Agio and Van Rieden that suggests that all of this is a little bit uh, not very convincing, is that empirically, industrial policy and competition policy should be seen as complement, not substitute. I'd add to that, that if you have a fairly objective review of empirical work on all of those previous theories, the results are very unsupportive of those theories. So that's my point of departure. I don't like industrial trade policy. I don't think that in most cases they work. But on the other hand, as chief economist of DigiCom, that's not my business. As chief economics of DZ count, especially in the countries not, not like the US, where member states have the right to have the industrial policy and make their own mistake, that's not my business. My only business is to make sure that whatever they come up with is compatible with competition and unification of the single market. Now, if in the process of doing this, we weed out bad type of industrial policy, the more the better. But that's not my primary business. I can come back to the forerun of this, but I'm going to stop for now so that other people can have their say. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Um, uh, this was most enlightening. Uh, maybe Lars, um, if you could elaborate a little bit on the, what researchers tell us about the development of concentration and competition in general in Europe, maybe from the small economies perspective. I don't know if you can see me. Uh, I promise we had a camera or can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Not see me, but uh, at least the sound. Okay. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Could, yeah, yeah, we hear you and there's a good picture. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Just continue. I think we can learn a lot from US experience. Uh, as uh, Fiona talked about, there is not a, it's not a very uh, uh, nice story in the last 30 years. There are some uh, development in the US with a uh, higher concentration, and then you see uh, higher prices, less innovation, and lower growth, and unequal distribution. So you can see there are some development in the US. And what I do is uh, using that experience from the US to, to warn against the similar development in Norway because if we if we go in a direction with uh, higher concentration we can have that kind of detrimental effects also in the Norwegian economy so that US at least it's not helpful for the US but it's helpful for Europe as, as, a, as a guide for what could what could be bad uh, there's one very interesting study by Gutierrez and Philippon. They have several studies, but one study is about Europe versus uh, the US, uh, and they look at uh, the, the development in uh, margins and in, uh, in concentration and so on, and they find a uh, difference between Europe uh, and uh, US, but uh, in, in the US they have the more higher concentration, higher margins, while in, in Europe you don't see the same effect. And they point to two different important elements explaining that. First, they say that uh, in Europe you have independent, independent institutions and to a larger degree than in, in, uh, in, in the US and you have less lobby uh, activity in a way also so it's in Europe than in, in, in the US. So then as a result of that they say that can partly explain what you see it's a stricter competition policy enforcement in Europe last 30 years than we see in the US. On, Overall, now Pierre mentioned there is a new uh, court decision which will make us a bit pessimistic about what's happening uh, from now on. But uh, if you look uh, back, it's 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 better in in Europe than in, in that in the U.S. We have uh, been inspired by the, what we have uh, heard from the U.S. about the development. So we we asked for a study of, of the Norwegian economy where we asked them to find out what happened to concentration and margins in Norway the last 30 years <clears throat> and we uh, saw that uh, uh, it's it's a rather stable uh, competitive situation in Norway in contrast to the US we started out with a higher concentration than in the US no surprise because we are a small country with a smaller market but then we see there's there's a there's a less concentration uh, over time in Norway 
and uh, then we see the margin is quite stable or slightly higher. So it's 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 really different development than the U.S. and it's much better development than than the U.S. And why it's not so bad in uh, in uh, compared to in Norway compared to the U.S. I think one important element is that Norway is part of the internal market. We are a very open economy. That means that it's very important to us with import and exports. So that the uh, import is important for. Uh, for the, the domestic markets, to have foreign firms active in the domestic market is important. That helps to have a competitive situation. And also, I would say we have a rather strict murder control in Norway. We have uh, more bans in, uh, of murders than in uh, many other countries. For example, in 2016, we had three bans, which is quite high for a little country. Uh, so we try to be strict on murder control. And murder control is the core thing about the competition policy in my view because that's about the future uh, competitive landscape if you uh, that's about the structure in in the future so merging control is important and when it comes to the small country perspective in a way we and the other Nordic countries are in a in a in a way in a critical situation because we have small markets and then rather few firms at the outset and then it's even more important to to stick to a strict merger uh, control uh, system in order to avoid what you have seen in the US. So for us, it's very important to, to, to avoid the development we saw in the US and uh, murder control is the most important part of that. Thank you. Thanks, Lars. Uh, uh, Gilve, when you have had the opportunity to, to listen to the, the Jonathan and Fiona on, on the, the on the west side of the Atlantic and to Lars and Pierre, what what do you take out of this discussion for a small economy, perhaps like Iceland? Well, there are of course a, a lot of lessons for uh, Iceland and other small uh, economies, uh, and in general, there are a lot of similarities uh, on, on, between the two sides of the Atlantic. The, the European approach to competition policy or antitrust policy has its roots in the US. And uh, as a result, the regulatory framework is in many ways uh, quite comparable. Um, the US government historically led the way and was more aggressive in enforcing competition policy for the century. But in recent years, perhaps the last quarter of a century or so, the EU has, however, gradually become more assertive and efficient in this field, while the U.S. is starting to lag behind. And this, of course, has many explanations. One being the push towards integrating European markets, creating a common market. This called for aggressive competition policy, both at the national and, and supranational level. Another being developments in U.S. politics, including how political campaigns are financed that have given large corporations have a more lobbying firepower and allowed them to push for deregulation or at least very relaxed enforcement. And this, of course, does not apply only in the realm of competition policy, but also, for example, environmental and financial regulation. Now, of course, things aren't perfect in Europe, European industry lobbies as well, but it has been uh, somewhat less likely to prevail especially not at the supranational level. Um, it's simply harder to convince uh, Brussels than it is to convince your local politicians. For a small country like Iceland, we have seen this very clearly, as most of the most important steps, steps that have been taken towards opening up local markets have not been taken at the initiative of local politicians, but rather due to the need to have our regulatory framework in harmony with that of the rest of the so-called European economic area. And the first steps were actually taken well before the establishment of the EEA, when we joined EFTA 50 years ago or so. For European competition, the most imminent threat is that political developments undermine the generally open common market and the regulatory framework that is needed for it to work efficiently. Nationalistic and even xenophobic forces are clearly on the rise in Europe and, and of course also many other parts of the world. This can eventually lead to fragmentation of markets. The explanation for the rise of these forces is complicated but includes economic stagnation from the viewpoint of some regions and groups, 
and this has to be addressed, but it's probably well beyond what we can try to do today in this webinar. Thanks. Um, Jonathan, Fiona, Lars, do you have any comments? Uh, I'd like to make, I have two comments on the on this discussion. Uh, one is to, to um, I guess, echo some of Fiona's sadness, I think, is how to, how to put it. It used to be that the United States was the uh, jurisdiction to emulate for an antitrust enforcement around the world, and it's unfortunate now that we've become the, uh, um, the object lesson about what not to do, uh, uh, which is, un um, and uh, my other comment is, I'm not so sure about the lobbying explanation uh, for uh, uh, differences between, let's say, the U.S. and Europe. Um, in the early 19, in the early 2000s, I would have said there was a great deal of convergence in the, between the, the uh, Europe and the United States in how to think about antitrust uh, uh, issues, uh, particularly. Um, and so, uh, and I don't see any particular reason why U.S. institutions became more susceptible to lobbying after that, or European institutions less susceptible after that, uh, which you would need to explain, to, to look to lobbying to explain the diversions. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a minor uh, uh, qualification. There certainly are differences in the, in the jurisdictions now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, so, I uh, Sorry, I'll say one sentence. One I actually think the lobbying is quite important. I think it shows up in the United States more vigorously in areas like regulation. And uh, unfortunately, now it's showing up in law enforcement. But it's been a political power in elections and political power um, through lobbying has been a major reason for the increase in inequality in the United States, in my opinion. It's created a bunch of rules that allow transferring wealth from. I'll stop there. Are you then? Well, I just answer one second, which is that, that uh, there's a difference between what you're saying, Fiona, which is about broad trends and that sort of thing, and yeah. the individual rules and corporate uh, uh, deci decisions with respect to individual transactions, which was more what I was focusing on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But just to clarify, Fiona, uh, that you're saying that the, the competition and re regulatory agencies in the U.S. are captured. I think the regulatory agencies so you, largely you, are. Uh, I mean, you you look at financial services, for example. That's a classic. Uh, the Department of Transportation, uh, we've just learned, was allowing Boeing to regulate itself, um, and has a history of, I think, caring more about airline profits than consumer welfare. So we have a lot of captured uh, uh, agencies. I mean, agriculture is now getting a lot more attention in the United States. We're giving a lot of bailout money to very large agribusiness that's not even American. Uh, and farm workers are not part of the uh, group that's being protected. So it's a big, big way in which we transfer funds from the poor to the rich. Uh, I have part of the meeting, I just rejoined, so I don't know what the question was. Yeah. Well, you're, okay. You're, all, you're okay, maybe if you come to okay. If we come to you again uh, in a moment, Pierre, uh, <laughs> we have been discussing on... I, I can answer anyway, but... <laughs> Jonathan raised the question on the, the national champions and uh, and we maybe wanted to have a little more discussion on, on which arguments are for and against increased emphasis of national champions and maybe to begin with you, Pierre, uh, of course, as we know, Germany and France have criticized the, the Commission for how it has handled some of its merger investigations. Um, uh, what is your answer to that? Is the GT comp making it um, impossible for European firms to grow into effective competitors? Okay, so uh, a few points. First, uh, the fact that states are never happy when we bar their mergers has nothing to do with a new emphasis on industrial policy. They've never been happy. Whenever you block a merger, you get heat. 
Okay, so uh, now it's under the guise of competition of industrial policy, but it's nothing to do uh, with that. Now, let's try to take uh, the argument seriously. First, I would ask how many European champions have actually been successful and try to get significantly be behind Airbus, uh, the numbers are going to be small. Second, except for Siemens Alstom, point to me a number of mergers that have prevented the emergence of European champions. Go farther than that, point to me in the US and other countries where supposedly people are not as tough, champions and very successful firms that grew mostly through mergers. So that would be my preamble. The second one is, okay, let's still think that for some reason you believe merger is essential to creating champions. Why would that be so? Why is because it leads, of course, to kind of a lower cost. We call this efficiencies and synergies. Looking at those is an integral part of our merger review process. You say, yes, 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 yes. But you fail to take into account that that's just foreign competition. We do take into account foreign competition is potential entry. We pay a lot of uh, attention to uh, imports. And in the case of Siemens Alstom, for example, the, you know, the famous Chinese competitors and never sold kind of any kind of significant amount in the EU. So you get to, yes, 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 but you take too short a time horizon. Well, no, we don't. I know that in the merger, notice uh, people talk about kind of a two years horizon, but we do adapt the horizon that we, uh, uh, that we look at depending on, on the industry, of course. The only thing to keep in mind is that if you adapt the horizon, you adapt it for everything. You adapt it for the harm, you adapt it for the efficiency, you adapt it for the timing of entry, okay? And you, get, you don't you don't get to choose. So one can, of course, disagree on how we actually apply the criteria, it is possible. I'm not going to say either way. So one would disagree about the way those criteria were applied to the specific merger like Siemens Alstom. But in terms of having criteria that would allow for a justifiable kind of a industrial European champion cases, kind of everything is there in the merger guidelines. So frankly, trying to say that we have to change the merger guideline in order to accommodate this kind of industrial policy, whether it is good or not, makes no sense whatsoever to me. Uh, maybe Lars, if you continue on, 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 on this subject, uh, uh, what effect would this increased emphasis on national champions or European champions have on merger and state aid? I agree a lot with Pierre here. There is uh, not really a difference from his view. I think first there's a political economy argument. There is about a, they talk about in a way, put it bluntly, um, invasion of foreign firms. And we talk about the Chinese firms, uh, but this is about subsidies. And so then the direct mass measure is to look at state aid and state aid measure. Yes. And uh, I think that's important. That's that's what's really a uh, targeted measure you know, on this so-called problem. In to that degree, it is a problem. So, and we support an initiative by the European Commission re recently. They have a state aid uh, initiative, so uh, that's, that's a good thing. I think uh, if you look at uh, murder control instead, that's a very indirect and dangerous way to, to, to solve the, what you call a problem, if it is a problem. So I think you know, when you talk about relaxing murder control, that's problematic and I, I'll put, Put forward three reasons. First, it's detrimental to domestic consumers. Uh, so, merger control is a consumer welfare standard, uh, and it's that means the ban of merger only if it's detrimental for the consumers in Europe. Uh, and as Pierre said, efficiency is a part of that uh, that uh, analysis. Potential entry is a part of that. So, uh, in, when you see at the number of bans uh, of um, mergers in Europe, there are very few, it's, uh, approximately one a year. So, it's not that many bans we have. So there are many voices saying that we need more, not less competition in Europe. There's a statement from uh, a lot of competition economists last summer and from competition lawyers last summer. And the Nordic Director General for Competition also had a, had a statement saying that uh, we need more competition rather than less competition and we need a strict merger control. 
And the other point, which is goes directly into the question about uh, we think about the, na na the nation, I, I think uh, relaxing murder control because of so-called national champions, that's detrimental to domestic welfare, especially in open economies. And the reason is, if we relax murder control, that means that we allow for a murder that uh, probably is price increasing because we want to stop them uh, at the outset. Uh, and that means to lower domestic murder, higher prices, foreign firms are some kind of free riders in this domestic market on the murder. So consumers are ripped off and part of the loss is then in a way transferred to foreign firms. So if you try to think about domestic welfare, national welfare, it's not so clear that national champions is something you should go for. And the third and maybe most important argument, it's uh, I think uh, national champions so, and relaxing murder control, that's detrimental to domestic firms in the long run. And that comes back to what Jonathan talks about, uh, competing uh, in domestic market leads to com competitiveness in, in the international market. So competitive domestic markets is a stimulus to innovation uh, and you learn to compete at home and then you go abroad. And I also uh, plan to refer to this study by Michael Porter from the 80s, uh, and you also referred to some other studies, uh, uh, Jonathan. Uh, I would like to mention one example from Norway. Uh, we have uh, farmed salmon in Norway, which uh, uh, expanded a lot during the 80s and the 90s. We had a regulation in Norway at that time, which was the opposite of national champions uh, uh, in a way, because it was impossible to have a, a national uh, firm, you have to have a local connection. That means you have to, a lot of local firms, and many firms in the industry, and they innovated a lot, uh, many of them, many small firms and very in innovative uh, the first uh, decades. So they had enormous growth despite the ban on creating a national champion. So if you look at the small country perspective, it's very important that small countries can uh, have a competitive uh, landscape at the domestic market and then you can uh, learn them to, to compete in the domestic market, and then they can go on the stage, the international stage afterwards. So if you love for large European champions, that can be uh, harmful for small countries, because if you have large European champions, it could be large also in the small domestic market, which is very harmful. Yeah, I'll stop there. So the European colleagues were do you have any further comments on this issue? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, two two uh, uh, comments. Uh, uh, one is uh, thinking about uh, what Lars just said. The um, I, it's interesting that Michael Porter was um, uh, uh, so uh, prominent in uh, explaining why domestic competition is good for international competitiveness. He is also uh, one of the early people who um, uh, saw the importance of uh, clusters like Silicon Valley in, uh, in creating uh, uh, innovation. Uh, and it wasn't just Silicon Valley and computers. There are you know, places, I think there's like a town in Italy that has shoes and you know, a Georgia furniture air, uh, air, uh, town with lots of externalities from uh, getting uh, uh, rivals in uh, a, a general uh, sector uh, in close proximity. And you lose that with uh, with national champions. Uh, and I think Porter's, I, 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 without knowing, I would guess that his work on that issue and his work on um, competitive advantage of nations were interacting in his mind and he was seeing a similar problem through two different lenses. And my other uh, comment is, uh, it's just striking the way uh, uh, Pierre articulated the um, way the arguments were going in, in Europe today about national uh, champions, how similar they are to the way, to the way I thought the, the particularly the uh, argument in the, about the, the um, uh, steel mergers were in, in, in the 1980s uh, in the US. We started a slightly different place because the merger guidelines then and the merger practice was more hostile to efficiencies than it is now, and we don't have, we didn't have, uh, you know, and we still don't have state aid uh, regimes, which uh, adds a different, uh, adds a little bit extra uh, uh, issue uh, uh, to, to the to discussion. But nevertheless, it seemed like the uh, debates had a lot of parallels, and that uh, uh, there's actually something uh, to learn uh, in Europe from what uh, the U.S. did back then, back when we were uh, uh, a uh, jurisdiction to emulate. 
Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Gilvi, would you maybe continue? You last mentioned, of course, the 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 perspective of the small economies within the uh, European economic economic area. But uh, what do you think? Yeah, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, in general, I think that uh, a focus on national champions. Uh, especially if, if it's government policy, it would not be a positive development. Even for uh, the larger economies in Europe, uh, or the US for that matter, but for smaller economies, the damage could be substantial. Uh, pushing for national champions is an inherently flawed approach with an generally abysmal track record. Does anybody remember British Leyland now? That was for a fleeting moment the third world's third largest car maker before it crashed and burned. The only reasonably successful case of this in Europe is Airbus, as Pierre pointed out. But that does not seem like a good model for other industries for, for many reasons. For small economies, such a move would either leave them shut out of important markets or force them to build their own national champions operating at highly inefficient scale. Uh, competition authorities in both US and Europe in general have the tools to fight this development, but the danger is that political pressure thwarts their use. This pressure can be brought about in particular by lobbying by the corporate sector, but also due to support for ideological reasons, both on the right and the left end of the political spectrum. And then the fight is complicated, uh, especially if competition authorities in one region try to rein in abuse by national champions from other regions or open up markets where they have a dominant position. This could, for example, include the EU taking on US-based internet giants or the US government taking on Chinese industrial giants with strong ties to the Chinese government. The politics involved are daunting and complicate resolving the economic and legal issues. Uh, but so, uh, and but this issue is not going away. We're going to be dealing with pressure to create national giants, probably uh, pretty much forever. I think that's it for me. Hello? They are frozen. No, we lost the moderator. Are they frozen? <laughs> I wanted we to ask the moderators. They're, mute, they're I muted. Wanted to <laughs> one of the questions that. Uh, you're muted. Pierre, can I just, uh, since we are still on, I would like to answer yeah. one of the audience questions. Okay. When protectionism is promoted, I. So sure, is, the one about the. As a social, uh, a political instrument, right? That that one. When yeah, when right as a I social good. I cannot hear you anymore. <laughs> as a, what what could the panel comment yeah, on how question. agencies should react when protectionism is promoted, not just for industrial policy reasons, but as a social good, like agriculture providing employment in rural areas. I think it's very important to alert uh, to to communicate to the government and the people that when you don't enforce competition, you're taxing the people directly through higher prices because there isn't competition. And that's hidden compared to taxing them, collecting and subsidizing rural employment in some way. But that that second way to do it is more honest because it actually delivers the, a subsidy that is targeted to the thing that is of value rather than just saying well we don't we're going to stop this industry from competing and then prices will be higher and sure they'll make more money but we don't know what they're going to spend that money on they might just give it to their shareholders or do less innovation or something i feel that the, this way of of subsidizing is much much less precise and has much more uh possibility of corruption compared to a an explicit subsidy for the activity of interest yeah, well, let me let me kind of abound a little bit in that sense. Uh, 
we do recognize there are other objectives, security objective, employment objective, even nowadays green objectives, right? And those are legitimate objectives. So there are two issues. Is first, how are they best dealt with? And quite frankly, uh, mergers to make big producers would be very, 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 very low on the list of the best way of addressing any of these objectives. On top of it, as Fiona says, again, being an old trade person, one of the big problems with trade protection is that it is hidden. It is hidden from anybody except the lobbyist. So it creates a very, very opaque environment where undemocratically what gets supported under the guise of various objectives is decided uh, uh, you know, behind closed doors. And that's not something that I would want to come down. Related to one of the questions here that which asked, what is the panel's opinion about the current 19 related decision in state that is there a risk that in the long, long term they will increase protect protectionism and make antitrust enforcement difficult? One example could be civil aviation. Pierre, do you have comments? Oh, of course, of course, I, believe me, I, I, I wear those cars on that one too. I've got I've got team members who haven't slept for several <laughs> weeks on those things. <laughs> so, so the point is that first, let's get rid of the idea that it's anything goes. You know, we fought very, very hard to make sure that actually the basic principle of state aid, proportionality and non-selectivity, are respected as much as possible. Hmm. Proportionality. It's both through ensuring proper remuneration of the state and making sure in the case that for the case of liquidity needs and for the case of recapitalization, that first you don't get too much. And thank you for the CEO of Lufthansa for making a comment going the other way just the day before. Uh, and also making sure that the state doesn't stay there too long. So there are lots of you know, conditions like an increase of the cost of participation over time, uh, interdiction to having too high a pay for the CEO, interdiction from uh, acquisition, uh, limit or interdiction to paying dividends that are there to precisely convince the firm to get out of the deal when they no longer need it. Mm -hmm. There are also the, in terms of selectivity, we're not as lucky because clearly given the needs, not everybody's gonna get the aid. And of course, you know, politically, who's going to get the aid? Well, usually the big firms and the big employers. And therefore, the, yes, that could have bad effect on the structure that we get after COVID. And that could be long last. So, which is why it, in the Lufthansa deal, for example, we actually did impose remedy like condition. We imposed the divestment of slots at the two most congested airports, which is Frankfurt and Munich. Mm -hmm. Might not be perfect, but at least we insist precisely on having competition remedy because precisely it's not that they've done anything wrong from the point of view of competition, but precisely we know that the ones that are going to get the help mm -hmm. are the ones that, you know, tend to have significant market power. Mm -hmm. okay. And then, of course, the next stage will be when we get into the recovery to kind of be especially vigilant on mergers and antitrust to make sure that we can restore the acceptable market structure as far as possible, as fast as possible. Could I comment on this uh, on no. protectionism, uh, if, if I may? I think we have the call for protectionism uh, here already in a in very special way. If you look to Norway, for example, there is a lot, there's a slogan saying that you should buy Norwegian products much more than before. So no, it's no buy Norwegian products. If that's really a follow up on consumer behavior, it means that the imported products can lose sales in a dramatic way. Uh, and the long-run effect is dramatic, especially for Nordic countries. We, we are very op open economies with a lot of uh, import and exports. So competition in many domestic markets are often driven by foreign firms and their products, for example, in the banking industry. So if you if really follow up on the, that kind of slogan, buying Norwegian products, it's it's a dramatic. And this has to do with competition also, because it's, uh, it's about lowering the number of uh, active firms in the market can be in the long run and uh, less imports also less uh, could lead to less potential for export so this is a, this is this is dangerous and we as competition agencies should uh, warn against the competitive effect of that kind of uh, movement mm -hmm. and although actually, I have if you, to say, you know me 
I, I think this is very this is very pernicious this effect because on one hand you can say oh you know you just change the conference of the preference of your people in your country there's no loss from that if they really feel they should buy Norwegian but at the same time they create this reduced incentive to innovate on which there is a coordination problem between uh, but between the consumers I indulge my taste for local production and my effect on the innovation incentive is small so I'm not going to take them into account so it, it's really very pernicious yes mm -hmm. Yeah, Fiona, uh, so you want to say, add something. Yeah, the American perspective on this is quite different because we have such a large country that mass produced things are inevitably kind of low quality. And so there is a big, I would say, if you can afford it, there is substantial uh, trends now to buy locally. And by locally, we don't mean the United States, we mean much closer to, to your place of living. So for, for me, a Connecticut farm, for example, or a Vermont uh, dairy or something, and local micro brews and so on. And I think this is part of consumer taste and about the environment zero KM food, or they want to support their neighbors. Uh, I think this is fine. Um, but but I would I think the framing of it really depends on whether it's it's about your taste or whether it's I am against foreign people or foreign goods. It's not in the U.S. It's not like that. It's more about um, I value the creativity of my neighbors, and so I would like to buy clothes that are made by my neighbors rather than clothes in Bangladesh because uh, that makes me feel good. Uh, I think this is fun. But, but but it's uh, if it is so that it's it's one thing what the consumer decides to do, but the other what the government decides to do yes. for the consumer. So, so yes, in my in my example, an issue uh, exactly with tariff. the consumer is deciding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jonathan, would you like to add something to this discussion on protectionism? Uh, uh, only to. Uh, Two comments. One is to observe that, uh, again, going back in U.S. history, uh, that uh, there, there, there have been times when, it, in you might describe them as emergencies, economic or otherwise, where there was pressure to reduce the antitrust, to limit the antitrust laws. I'm thinking, particularly in the Great Depression, when uh, we both had a legislative uh, 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 change that allowed caramelization essentially, and also pretty much nearly simultaneously, the Supreme Court allowed uh, a coal cartel, uh, and all that got repudiated after the Depression. It didn't last very long, uh, and the the uh, the, the NRA, which was the legislative program, was only a couple of years uh, too. And then in the Second World War, the uh, uh, that led uh, uh, there was political pressure on these um, Thurman Arnold, who was the most a famous assistant attorney general for antitrust to back off from enforcement and they kicked him upstairs to become a judge and and uh, all that uh, but but uh, antitrust came back afterwards and uh, uh, after the and in fact uh, uh, the uh, the uh, to build steel plants uh, they gave uh, the the dominant firm Alcoa the right to to uh, uh, run a whole bunch of new I'm going to say aluminum plants a new aluminum uh, plants, and then after the war, they sold them off to create Kaiser and you know, a couple other firms to, uh, to to compete. And so we never really lost antitrust. We, there were, it, ultimately, in retrospect, it was these were temporary uh, uh, limitations and emergencies that were misguided, and uh, uh, the um, agencies, uh, the uh, system, preserved its its interest in competition, uh, uh, but. But that, uh, and then my other comment was on the discussion about local uh, uh, demanding, demand shifting uh, to local uh, uh, products, or possibly the government interest in in uh, making that happen. And and I think I think Lars was saying this, but I'll say it a different way. That that, that puts a premium on um, on uh, uh, ensuring uh, local competition in, in in those markets. And it's just the opposite of the motive to create national champions. Uh, you, you, if, if you're going to be, if, if uh, foreign firms are going to be at a disadvantage, for whether for consumer or governmental uh, restrictions, you've got to have more domestic firms to, to preserve competition. Mm -hmm. Gilbe, would you like to add something on this? Yeah, I, I think that 
uh, people are drawing uh, completely wrong conclusions if they think that the disruption in, in, in trade and travel due to the pandemic calls for uh, countries or regions moving to self-sufficiency in, in food and medicine, etc. Uh, that that's just not feasible, at least not uh, except at a very high cost, because it will be such an inefficient system. The, there is an economic rationale for, you know, stockpiling oil and, and maybe you know PPE and and, and uh, some other essentials like that. But uh, stockpiles don't cost that much compared to if you completely uh, switch to a local supply chain for everything. That the cost of that would be. Astronomical. Um, uh, that said, I agree with Fiona. If, if uh, consumers want to buy local because, uh, well, for whatever reason, one of them could be lower carbon footprint, that's fine. Uh, but uh, governments should not force people to uh, buy local uh, due to the fact that we might at some point have another pandemic or some other thing that disrupts uh, global supply chains. Uh, that, that's simply a highly inefficient way to ensure uh, supply of uh, basic necessities. Uh, I think this is relevant for our last 10-15 minutes to discuss a uh, recession or an economic downturn uh, facing most nations in the world. Uh, before we dwell into that, I want just to give a quick update. We have asked the participants four questions and 87% uh, of them think, uh, claim that competition enforcement is a key driver of productivity growth and competitiveness. Competition at home enhances a firm's ability to compete abroad. And there are around 13% that are uh, uh, choose the other alternative. Uh, for those here that are in competition enforcement, uh, those that have voted uh, claim that there are, I see the numbers are changing now, but that guidance and abuse cases should be the ones that competition enforcers should focus on now in times of crisis, COVID, um, in dealing with the economic consequences of COVID-19, which of the two would you find to be a sounder policy uh, to expose firms to foreign competition? <laughs> percent pick that uh, option and around 30 percent to protect firms from foreign competition so it seems that the panel uh, is agrees on that that would not be a good uh, a policy to protect firms from foreign competition but uh, they attend those who are attending do not all agree at least those that have uh, answered uh, and with regards so this is this uh, with the final question, should countries react to the economic downturn by changing competition enforcement? Then around 60% are uh, on the view that no changes are needed. So before we step into the final chapter of the panel, I encourage all of the participants to vote. So we will have uh, reliable numbers here. Uh, but yes, Paul, just wanted to uh, mention these things now. Yeah, well, we have been discussing a little bit the reaction to COVID-19 and, uh, and we have earlier in this uh, debate discussed the uh, the level of competition enforcement both on the west and on the east of the Atlantic. Uh, one question from me would be for any of you to comment on um, what about the toolbox of competition authorities, both in the US and in Europe, and uh, in that respect, uh, it's interesting to see that the last week the commission uh, published for consultation uh, uh, a new tool uh, of ex ante and then uh, a market investigation tool with uh, the possibility of intervention similar to that of the the British one and the Icelandic one so uh, are there any of you that would comment on this I would be happy to. I don't think it's related to COVID. I think this is about big tech. Yeah. I think it's about um, situations where, for example, um, 
let's imagine it's nobody's fault. Nobody broke an antitrust law, but you end up in a place that is not working very well for consumers. Mm -hmm. You could imagine this would be caused by network effects, for example. Somebody wins competition for the market, and they're very, very strong switching costs, and then you just have a market structure that you're stuck with. This is a situation where possibly the antitrust laws are not useful. And instead, um, there's, I think, Pierre, could you mute maybe, or Lars, there's some background noise. Um, and instead you might want a tool that lets the authority just go investigate, uh, discover that things are not working well for consumers and propose some remedies without uh, accusing any firm of necessarily violating any antitrust law. I think this is a, a very interesting and powerful tool. I think it's quite useful in a lot of contexts that we're seeing today that are problematic, but I don't think it has anything to do with the virus. Before we go to the COVID uh, or the competition policy uh, discussion into the future, there's one question here which is directly related to what uh, Fiona was mentioning. Uh, network effects network effects occur when the value of goods or service increase the more people use it uh, how can antitrust enforcement better balance the benefits of large networks versus, versus healthy competition to, to ensure the best outcome for consumers so i think this fiona or and other that are willing to uh, answer yeah would be appreciated i'll i'll give two sentences on this i think network effects really raise the stakes for the competition authority. The competition authority has to be really vigilant in the first phase to make sure that it's competition on the merits. So whoever wins deserves to win. And then after they have won and they have this very large market share and we have effectively a monopoly, then of course the question is when is the nascent competitor going to get traction to overthrow the monopoly? And this requires extreme vigilance by the authority to make sure that these nascent competitors are not squashed because you will not see 50%, 50% or 33%, 33%, 33%. This is not a market structure we see when there are strong network effects. We see 99.1 and then it flips. Um, so protecting the 1% entrance is extremely important. So I think it just raises the stakes for competition enforcement. Mm -hmm. could, could I just follow up on that, Fiona said? I, I totally agree. And I think that's uh, very important to think about is you call it killer acquisitions also. And so one challenge in uh, at least some uh, jurisdiction is, is the threshold levels for murder investigation. And I uh, know we have a, a system that we can uh, we ask for notification of firms below the threshold level. And we can also ask particular firms about uh, notifiers about uh acquisition acquisition that they make so that's the way to to try to 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 be on the alert and then uh, look look for these uh, potential killer acquisitions okay more comments on this or all uh, the yes. this in authority yes i'd like to comment a bit uh mm -hmm. the, net, the network effect is uh is actually problematic for several reasons one is that we just don't know how strong the network effects are, and especially at the beginning of an industry. And there are industries that have very strong network effects on that up. We're also not sure of how long network effects become very, very strong. For example, if you look at search, there is evidence that, you know, even if a rival can have 10 billion search, having 2 billion more give you a significant advantage. But is it the case in logistic? And if you think about different platforms, there are different sources of advantages. One is search, the other one is logistic, the other one is straight person-to-person uh, -person network externality and so on. So those network externality are not a single animal. They're very different between uh, between the platforms. Therefore, they evolve very differently around the life cycle of the industry. Okay. Now, the more difficult case is the one where they evolve very, very fast because then you are in kind of tipping market type of territory. Again, having network effect doesn't mean that it has to tip, but it's going to tip more likely with network effects than others. And there's this unavoidable trade off. As long as, as Fiona said, the competition is of the merit, you've got to give the pioneer an incentive to build up those networks and to be rewarded over a sufficient amount of time for that. 
But after that, when it comes essentially to kind of to the next generation of innovation, if we don't want that to be killed, I think probably the best approach, besides of course looking for anti-competitive practice, is to find ways of enforcing interoperability, either for free or for a fee. And sometimes you can do that as part of a remedy in an antitrust investigation. But, in, <clears throat> but given the technical difficulty of the things, uh, I think this kind of interoperability uh, outcomes will, might be better achieved through the new tools that we propose. Yeah, a digital regulator could do this if kind I of thing. Jump in. Well, yes, and actually, I think one of the nice things about the new tool is to precisely be able to allocate what should be the province of the regulator and what is the province of the competition authority. Would you like to comment? Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, I, I mean, network externalities are are, are 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 there, and for that reason, it might be most efficient to uh, not intervene in markets where somebody has a ninety nine percent market share, uh, at least temporarily. But it's very important that they are not uh, allowed to uh, leverage that market share to uh, uh, distort other markets. And, and one historical case where this was stopped was the Microsoft case in the 1990s, where Microsoft had a, a dominant position in operating systems and, and uh, office software, but was not allowed to leverage that into a dominant position in, in what was then uh, uh, much smaller than now, Internet services and with Internet Explorer and all that. And I think we, we need to take similar steps with regards to Google and Facebook, uh, et cetera. Uh, we can't allow them to uh, leverage their dominant position in, in one field uh, to distort competition in other fields. Mm -hmm. Fiona, one question for you and Jonathan, uh, related to this new tool that has been not introduced, but is being discussed in Europe. Uh, are there any changes that you see that are necessary or uh, for the U.S. antitrust enforcement? Yes, I think there are lots that are necessary. Um, I would say there's a pretty broad consensus except for the far right in the United States that we need more money in enforcement. There are people who would like to tweak a few things, people who would like to really tighten up enforcement and people who would like to abandon what we've got entirely and start again. Um, I think a very useful uh, and good bill is one proposed by Senators uh, Booker, Klobuchar, and Blumenthal, who are um, who have proposed tightening up U.S. law, particularly by disallowing a lot of these assumptions that I was talking about before that we've built up over the decades, and uh, doing a better job with uh, monopolization, with unilateral exclusionary conduct. So we need to make these changes if we want to have competitive markets in the United States. And I'll hand it over to John. Uh, so I am uh, Fiona, and uh, just want to add that uh, uh, some of the legislative proposals uh, um, would, would redress the error cost balance in U.S. Uh, uh, enforcement in, in, in the way the courts address, look at uh, uh, antitrust cases by essentially making it easier for plaintiffs uh, to uh, to prove their cases. Uh, right now, the uh, uh, the antitrust laws are uh, uh, um, too uh, generous to concerns about chilling uh, um, uh, efficiencies and uh, too little focused on deterring anti-competitive conduct. And there are various ways of changing, potentially of changing the law or shifting burdens that would uh, shift the balance uh, to uh, enhance antitrust enforcement and, and address our market power problem. We are coming towards the end of, 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 of the webinar. Um, we have covered a lot of issues. Um, would you like to uh, add something, any of you, as a closing remark? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? <laughs>
Thank you. This was fun. Okay. Maybe I will uh, end by uh, disclosing the results from the, the survey. It's quite similar as we, uh, as I told you earlier on, competition is a key driver of productivity. Yeah, those who have attended do mostly agree on that, 90%. Um, it seems that the resp respondents uh, want uh, think that that uh, domestic firms should be exposed to foreign competition, and it seems as well that the majority, around 60%, think that uh, the no changes are needed, at least to react to the economic downturn by changing competition enforcement. But that's maybe not directly related to what Jonathan and Fiona uh, mentioned earlier on. And for those that have, have attended, uh, we will send you, hopefully, the slides from John. Uh, we will send you the results from the survey. And these are the practical issues that I wanted to mention. So just in closing, I wanted to um, thank you very much for participating, both the panelists and, and the viewers, and, and those who have uh, participated through the polls and the uh, questions. Um, this has been highly interesting to us, at least, and hopefully to you also. And we will take this um, take 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 this discussion and uh, and uh, and um, see how we can use it uh, in our our strategy and emphasis in in the future. So so thank you very much and uh, have a nice day and, uh, and 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 goodbye. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the invitation. Yeah.